Hello, and thank you for joining us today for Fish and Richardson's post-grant webinar series. My name is Dorothy Whalen. I'm a principal in, Twin City, in Fish and Richardson's Twin Cities office. I'm joined today by my colleague, uh, Tasha Francis. Tasha is an associate from Atopics, and so once again, we're united, <laughs> or reunited, we've gotten the band back together to uh, discuss biopharma patents at, at the PTAB. Uh, in the handout section of the webinar widget, you'll find PDFs of our bios as well as the slide deck. For those of you in New York and New Jersey only, please complete the CLE sheet that is also available in the handout section. So if you're joining the post-grant webinar series for the first time, and if, if you're not, just bear with us for a moment, uh, this series explores important post-grant developments, decisions, and offers practice tips. Since we're both practitioners, we take more than an academic interest, and so what we try to do is keep you up to speed on trends, but also focus on decisions and developments that we think are, are of particular interest to practitioners. Our webinars are held bi-monthly on the second Wednesday of, of the month. And again, if you're joining us again, we, we, we welcome you back. Uh, so today's webinar will run one hour. It includes a question and answer period at the end of the program. You may ask questions at any time throughout the program by clicking the question section of the widget to submit your question. We'll do our best to answer them all at the end of the presentation, time permitting. However, please feel free to contact us personally after the webinar if that would be easier for you. We'd be happy to, uh, to talk to you. Uh, and now, before we get started, I have the, our, our disclaimer that I have to remind you that the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only, does not re necessarily reflect the, the opinions of Fish and Richardson, and it's also not intended to address every court or case situation. So with our housekeeping matters out of the way, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, Tasha, uh, who's gonna start us off on statistics. And what we're going to do for the statistics uh, here is actually focus on uh, Orange Book listed patents. So we're not, just for the statistics portion here, we're not going to be including biologics. We will actually are planning an upcoming webinar that will be devoted to biologics, but, but for now we thought some of these stats on Orange Book listed patents are very interesting and they, they warrant discussion. So that's where our focus will be today. We're, all, we're then going to review some biopharma decisions and case law developments. Um, those are actually going to focus on the issue of printed publications which is a very tricky issue, particularly in, in uh, we find in, in biopharma patents, and it's worth exploring uh, a couple of PTAB decisions that deal with whether a drug label is a printed publication. And then we're going to conclude with what to watch for in 2018. We're going to touch base on some legislative proposals that were developed with the biopharma uh, community uh, in mind. So with that, if we could go to the next slide, and I'm going to turn it to Tasha to do statistics. Great. Thank you, Dorothy. So um, I thought we'd start off by just looking at some statistics regarding the number of Orange Book patents that have been challenged by IPR. Um, the data here is shown from the institution of the IPR process uh, through year to date. Um, I think our numbers are good as of uh, last week. So here what we're seeing is that um, there was a slow uptake in the number of IPR petitions challenging Orange Book patents, um, you know, very few in the first years, 2013, 2014. And then we saw, saw a sharp increase in 2015 um, with 143 petitions. And that accounted for about 9% of all the petitions that were filed. So we saw this, this uptake. Um, and then over the past uh, two years, 2016 and 2017, we saw numbers kind of hanging around uh, 95, 96, uh, representing 5 or 6 percent roughly of all petitions that are being filed. Uh, what I think is interesting is that um, we find ourselves here in July um, of 2018, and so far we only have 19 Orange Book patents that have been challenged by IPR. And so when you look at this graphically, um, you know, this number is more uh, reflective of the earlier numbers that we saw in 2013-2014 as opposed to the numbers that we've seen in 2015 uh, through 2017. Uh, so this 19 
Uh, these 19 petitions uh, that have been filed year to date are account for about 2% of all petitions that have been filed thus far, which I think is uh, pretty interesting because I think had you asked me uh, last year, I would have expected that similar numbers perhaps uh, to what we've seen in 2016, 2017, some consistency there. Um, Dorothy, I don't know if you have any thoughts about uh, why we're seeing this decrease. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting development. And again, if we I know we're we're focusing our Orange Book and, and not biologics, but a lot of the growth in this area has been in the biologics and and not Orange Book listed patents. Um, I mean, one could speculate, so <laughs> one will. Um, I mean, it could be, and we're going to get into some additional stats. Um, it, it's actually, believe it or not, not all that easy for uh, for petitioners to get a petition instituted and then even to prevail on the final written decision. So that could be one factor. Um, another factor, frankly, could be, and we have to delve into this more deeply, is that the IPRs, when it, when it concerns an Orange Book listed patent, tend to track litigation. And so I know that, for, for example, in 2017, that was a big year for and the litigation. You then see a fair number of, of IPR petitions. So I would expect that if we saw a big uptick in and the litigation, we are, we're also going to see the, uh, the IPR numbers yeah. rise. Now, these this is just IPR petitions. It doesn't include PGR petitions, but you don't really see PGR petitions in this area. The, the patents generally are too old. Right. So. so I guess it would be, you know, maybe previewing something to watch for us to see how we uh, fare the rest of this year and then looking forward to see, you know, is this just an anomaly in 2018? Are numbers going to rebound back to the numbers we saw in previous years, or you know, is this just kind of be a fluctuating curve that um, we'll keep our eye on? And it's also something to bear in mind, um, or just keep in the back of your mind, because when we then uh, proceed at the at the end of the webinar and talk about some of the legislative developments, I mean, if the number of petitions are falling off, truly falling off, and this becomes a trend. Uh, you know, query whether some of these legislative uh, developments are even necessary. But we'll talk about that later in the program. Great. If we can go to the next slide, please. So on this slide, we've just identified some of the top petitioners of Orange Book patents. Um, so you'll see here we've listed, I believe we have about 18 of the most active petitioners. Uh, here you're generally seeing uh, the generic companies. Um, we're seeing, you know, Teva's on this list. We have Lupin, Mylan. Uh, the list is uh, presented there of the top 18 filers. Um, and, you know, we, we talked about one of the reasons why, you know, these petitioners might uh, grab a hold of one of the top five spots. You know, it might be the case that um, in certain instances they're focusing on bringing a particular generic version of a drug to market and that drug might be covered by multiple patents. And so that might be a reason why a particular petitioner has a, a higher ranking because perhaps they're focusing on a drug that's covered by a lot of patents and they're challenging uh, several of those patents at the same time in the process of bringing their drug to market. It's also not uncommon to see a single patent challenged in IPR by multiple petitioners. And those proceedings, and we, we've talked about this in the past, are often joined. But in, term, in rough numbers of, of petitions, those count here. Right. And we can go to the next slide. Here's the uh, opposite side of the coin where we look at the, uh, the top patent owners whose Orange Book patents have been challenged by all the, the petitioners we just looked at. Um, so you may or may not be surprised by, you know, the names that are appearing here. You have your brand name companies. Um, again, it's the same point. This is reflective that, you know, a particular company might have its blockbuster drug that's being challenged by multiple uh, petitioners. As a result, you know, its name comes up as one of the top patent owners that's having to defend its patents through these proceedings. Um, you know, for example, we see Gilead's on this list at number nine. I know in this past year or so they were challenged. Um, regarding their drug, uh, Sofosavir, by a public interest group, uh, the Initiative for Medicines Access and Knowledge. And that was 10 petitions right there. Um, so, you know, this, these are ways where one drug is drawing the attention of lots of petitions. And you see that, for example, for Anacor, um, it, it's, it's their antifungal. And that's attracted a number uh, of, of petitions. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So the stats here are cumulative data reflecting um, institution rates and broken down by technology type. 
And so again, this is data since the, the beginning of the IPR uh, process through July 6, 2018. And we're looking at the overall institution rates by various uh, classes. Uh, the blue line in the middle, uh, the third from the bottom, or excuse me, third from the top, that's our overall average. So on average, we're seeing 74% of the IPR petition being instituted. And then we can see um, this compares to uh, larger numbers that we're seeing in the mechanical and business method patent category. That's, that's the bottom line. We're seeing 77% institution rate, pretty high number there, um, followed by the electrical and computer uh, bucket of patents, and then the chemical patents. And for the purposes of this uh, presentation, we thought it was interesting to look at, well, how are the Orange Book patents doing and, and petitions there? And we're seeing they actually, as a category, have the lowest uh, on this It's graph. significantly lower. Yeah, 63% here, um, institution rate for Orange Book patents. Um, and this compares, uh, we have biopharma on here. That would be where the biologic patents, for example, would fall into. And that's slightly higher at 67%. Um, so we thought that this was a pretty interesting statistic. You know, we've seen uh, slow growth in this area of Orange Book patents being challenged. And as Dorothy alluded to earlier, um, that may or may not be a result of the fact that, you know, the Orange Book patent uh, IPRs aren't being instituted as much. Yeah, I mean, that 63% really sticks out to me. Now, I mean, maybe as a, from an absolute standpoint, that, that's still pretty high. Mm -hmm. uh, but... I think the message I would take from it as a, as a patent owner is, you, you know, the odds are not all that bad for you. There is, you have a, a, a good shot at defeating a, a petition prior to institution. The other thing to bear in mind with these stats is they also include, an institution is counted even if it were a partial institution. Right. And many of these decisions were, were simply partial institutions, not all grounds, not all claims. Well, now in the post-SAS world, you're not going to see that. It's, it's all up or all, da all down. Uh, it would be very, it will be very interesting to see whether any of these percentages change. Right. Um, you know, will we be seeing more patent owner preliminary responses? Because in, most of the cases you you defeat prior to institution, there's a there's a POPR. Um, it's rare where where the position is, is is defective enough that the 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 board just denies it without a POPR. Uh, will you be seeing more or less uh, or more fewer POPRs or Will you also be seeing actually fewer cases, fewer petitions being instituted because of the all up or all down? I mean, if a petition is overall weak, uh, even if there are some nuggets in there, maybe the the board exercises its discretion and, and denies the whole thing. Um, that's something we're actually monitoring. It's too early to tell, but um, these numbers, I mean, they're, they're, there's a possibility they'll even diminish further but that remains to be seen. Yeah, well, keep an eye on it, and that'll probably be the subject of another presentation yeah. maybe a year from now when we have some data to work with. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. So this slide is uh, reporting on the status of instituted claims uh, for IPR petitions that have reached a final written decision. So again, this data is from September of 2012 through present. On the left side, we have data related to the Orange Book listed patents. And on the right side, we have all other technologies excluding the Orange Book listed patents. So if we look at the Orange Book listed patents on the left, we're seeing that for the 119 uh, decisions, for final written decisions, we're seeing that um, there's kind of an uneven split. We're seeing 50% of all claims were canceled, and then 50% had one or more claims upheld. So all of the claims were upheld um, about 44% of the time. So that uh, is like the, the teal color on the right side of that circle. And then we have um, mixed findings in 6% of those cases for Orange Book patents. So about a 50-50 uh, tie there between claims being canceled and claims being upheld. And then if we compare that to all other technologies, uh, all claims are canceled on average 68% of the time. So that's a, that's a higher number. That's significantly a higher. Significantly higher number with all claims being upheld 17%. And that I think is in 
drastic contrast to the all claims being upheld 44% of the time in the orange book listed patents. And then again, we have, you know, 15% of mixed claim findings. And obviously, these green portions are, are going to go away. If we were to do this presentation in a year, we're not going to have these. No, 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 it's not just it's on final written decision. So you, oh, could, still have, you could still have the, the mixed claim findings. Right, right. Um, but I do think that, again, this, the, the, the disparity uh, between the Orange Book listed patents, which are all group 1600 patents, and other technologies is, is striking. You know, why is that? And actually, why even on institution is, are, are the numbers lower? I, I think that the, in, in the biopharma space with the Orange Book listed patents, you've got unexpected results right. uh, many times. And, and it's, an, the, it's the unpredictable arts. And so at least, you know, for, for, for a patent owner, that can be, be a powerful tool uh, when it comes to, to obviousness. You also, and we're gonna see this in, a, in another slide when you have the, the, the grounds, you don't see as many 102 grounds, which are, I mean, if you're going, 102 grounds are often easier to succeed on than, than, than obviousness. But I just think fundamentally, the technology is different. The patents right. are different. And again, bear this in mind when we go to talk about some of the legislative proposals. What I take away from, from these stats is, as a petitioner, don't think it's, it's a slam dunk that you've got to put together a really polished petition. Uh, it's thorough. Uh, for the patent owner, I think that the, the message is things are not as bad as you might think they are. You really got a fighting chance. Right. Great, and if we can go to the next slide. Um, so in terms of those types of claims that are being challenged in Orange Book patents, um, we, we took a brief look at those, the percentages to, to really determine, okay, what kind of um, claims are being challenged here? So just that, to take a step back, so for the Orange Book patents, remember these are including method of treatment claims, formulation claims, uh, compound claims, um, and there'll be other types of claims, for example, um, patents related to crystallization, for example. Um, and so as another reminder, process patents and metabolite patents are not included in the Orange Book. So looking at this bucket of claims, method of treatment, formulation, and compound, uh, what we're generally seeing is that method of treatment and formulation patents are the most widely challenged types of claims. Uh, they each make up about 40% of the challenges. So 40% of the Orange Book patent claims that are being challenged through IPR right now are method of treatment. Another 40% uh, are made up by the formulation claims. And then the compound or new chemical entity claims are roughly around 10% of the challenges. And so the remainder are going to the other types of claims we talked about. Which again, it's not surprising. Um, the, the new chemical entity or compound claims are really the toughest right. to, to attack. Um, with, form, with formulation, method of treatment, the, so you would say, think of those in the cycle, they would be second right. or even third generation those are really, they're, they're easier to attack, and it's where you see more of the action. Right. And that's consistent with district court litigation also. I mean, you're going to be seeing that the, the compound claims are, are the more difficult ones to bring right. down. Right, right. So. All right, so if we can go to the next slide. This slide discusses um, the grounds for Orange Book patents at the PTAB. So it basically is looking for, you know, 101, 102, 103, and 112 challenges, giving us a sense of what are petitioners raising and how are the decisions um, coming out based on those uh, grounds. So the top of the chart starts to talk about institution decision when, when these IPRs were instituted, the vast majority are 103. In fact, all down this chart is all 103 like we talked about earlier, um, to a le much lesser extent 102, and then you know, I would say rarely the 112 issues are coming up here. Well, because the 112 would have to be attacked in a PGR, right. and, and we're not we just don't we here. we just don't see those um, here. But yeah, as, as you know, Tasha, I mean, it, it's there are 103 challenges again, reflecting the the fact that your the formulation and method of treatment claims are, except in rare situations, are going to be 103 challenges. Exactly. All right, so if we can go to the next slide, this is a 
bit of a complicated graph, but we're uh, hopefully going to follow walk, the colors. Walk through it. Um, so basically, this is just a trial flow for Orange Book petitions at the PTAP. So if we start on the left hand side, uh, this is when we're starting with petitions that are being filed. Okay. So as we continue through the flow of the trial, so we have petitions and we're seeing an institution decision where the, the petition is denied in 20% of these cases in the Orange Book space. So that then we're going to have 61% institution for the Orange Book patent petitions. And then the remainder are coming out. They're not reaching that institution decision based on um, being dismissed for procedure reason, procedural reasons or settling otherwise. So we see settlement 9% um, of the time prior to an institution decision related to Orange Book patents. Well, and that's, we've seen that before. A lot of times you'll see a filing by a generic challenger uh, being used as le as leverage for a favorable settlement. Right, when they have concurrent district court litigation? Yep. 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 Okay, so then if we continue through with the trial flow, so of these uh, petitions that have been instituted, the 61%, we're seeing those that are reaching a final written decision are finding all claims upheld about 13% of the time. And we have this mixed claim finding uh, in one instance here. All claims are held unpatentable 15% of the time. And then we see that the claims were amended in one instance, which I think just speaks to the rarity of seeing amendments yep. uh, in general, not necessarily only limited to orange book patents. And then again, we see a series of these petitions that aren't even reaching the final written decision. Again, you know, some of them are being joined to other trials, so that's actually happening 21% of the time. Uh, another series that are being procedurally dismissed, that's 1%. Um, we're seeing another round of settlement around the same numbers, 9% there. Um, and then we had four instances of patent owner disclaiming. So if you group everything together by colors, uh, which is what is done at the bottom uh, in red, we have what they're quoting as a petitioner win 17% of the time. Um, they're calling it a patent owner win 61% of the time and uh, you know a partial uh, decision uh, in one instance. It's interesting that I find that they put settlement into a pat they consider a patent owner win, mm -hmm. but depending on the terms of the settlement, that, I guess. That's, that's, that's what I would think. <laughs> right. Um, but you know, Tasha, what again strikes me, and just for the just want to make sure people bear in mind, these are for trials that terminated in 2016 and 2017. Correct. Right. Um, and so. That was also the pre-SAS world where even some of those institution decisions were, were partial institutions. But again, what I find striking is the relatively high percentage uh, overall of a patent owner win. Right. So again, going back to the theme that it's not as bad as maybe um, folks might have thought at one time. Yeah. I mean, it's... And you know there is a, and maybe it's also a, a maturing of the even at the PTAB, but there are probably about 15 now, maybe a little more of, of judges you see over and over again um, in this space, and you do start to see a, a certain you know jurisprudence arising the the, the way they're approaching cases, um, which is beneficial but again I think we're, we're starting to see more of a, a pendulum swing towards the, the patent owners now we'll revisit these stats as Tasha noted um, maybe in about six months uh, it would be interesting to see whether some of these trends continue but again bear that in mind when we eventually move into talking to about some of the legislative right. proposals so if we can go to the next slide, since uh, you previewed uh, the implications of oil states and SAS, we thought, we thought we'd talk some more about that. Um, so this, this graph is just to serve as a, a springboard for discussing potential implications of those decisions in Orange Book related IPRs. So uh, this data that we have here is through April 24th, 2018, when the decisions came out. And this is discussing um, the decision types, basically in the Orange Book series of IPR petitions. Uh, this evaluates how many of those uh, had denied institution, had instituted in full, and those which had a partial institution. Um, and so in blue here, we see 37% of the petitions were denied uh, institution. And then we saw 
36% were instituted in full. And a big portion of this pie chart here, sorry, I got confused in my green slices. This is the chart where we're seeing 27% had a partial institution. So that's uh, a good chunk of this pie chart here, uh, which is uh, going to have to change, right? It has to. <laughs> in the post-SAS world, it has to. And so I think it's going to be interesting to see whether or not our pie chart becomes more blue or more purple here going forward. Well, and as at least said before in uh, um, other webinars uh, dealing with, with post-SAS, I think there's going to be a lot more uh, pressure on petitioners to do a really thorough petition because if it's all up or all down, if your petition is is dilute, you can dilute your petition with weak ground, and that may ultimately lead to the entire thing being the entire petition being denied. So that's something we're, we're monitoring. But it is that is a striking stat that there were so many partial institutions. It also sort of changes the game a little bit, I think, for for patent owners. Um, I mean, do you file a preliminary response now if you don't think you can attack all the grounds successfully. Something we're, we, we continue to wrestle with, um, although I still believe that for the patent owner in this space, you still want to try and avoid institution. And that typically requires a preliminary response. So. So again, previewing uh, maybe a year from now, we're going to have another pie graph that uh, is going to be maybe two shades, and we'll see which one uh, wins at that time. It's going to be a tie. It's going to be a tie, yeah. OK, so then if we go on to the next slide, we're going to transition away from statistics and talk about some recent biopharma decisions and case law developments that are relevant to practitioners. OK, and actually, have the next slide, please. So one of the issues that comes up over and over again in this space is printed publication. I mean, for an IPR, the, the grounds have to be based on, on printed publications. And oftentimes, petitioners try to rely on the label. And we're not, we're actually, just to make clear, we're now pivoting. We're not strictly focusing on Orange Book listed patents. Now we're also dealing with biologics. So when I say biopharma now, I'm, I'm including both, but the the use of a label as a printed publication, I mean, it comes up frequently, and it is very tricky. And what I've done here is pulled out a couple of, of decisions that are representative of some of the difficulties petitioners run into in trying to prove that a drug label is a printed publication. And alternatively, I think these, the, this pair of cases il illustrates some of the, the grounds that a patent owner can use to attack whether, a reference, whether the drug label is, is a printed publication. So the first case we have here is Sandoz v. Abvi. And the patent here involved a method of treatment, treating psoriasis by administering adalimumab, which is Humira. And the petitioner relied on the Humira package insert as one of the references in its challenge. The, pra the, the package insert actually talked about uh, the, the dosing regimen for rheumatoid arthritis, but the argument was, well, then you would extend it to, to psoriasis. And here, the PTAB denied institution because the petitioner failed to prove that the package insert was publicly accessible to the extent necessary to qualify it as a, as a printed publication. So we go to the next slide, please. Uh, uh, here we go. So what is the legal standard on public accessibility? Um, I've actually reproduced it here without the, the citations. Um, it's basically the Klopfen, we call them the Klopfenstein uh, factors. And public accessibility is often the touchstone here for, for printed publication. So what does it require? Well, I mean, I'll just read it. It said it's publicly accessible, requires a satisfactory showing that the document has been disseminated or otherwise made available 
to the extent that persons interested and ordinary skilled in the subject matter of the art exercising reasonable diligence can locate it. So a party seeking to introduce the, the reference, you, have, you need proof of its dissemination or that it was available and accessible, again, to the persons to whom the art was applicable, and they would be able to find that, that, uh, that document through the exercise of reasonable diligence. Well, let's see how that now applied to the Humira package insert. Next slide, please. So what did the petitioner put in? Well, in addition to the, the package insert itself, the petitioner included an FDA approval letter asserting that, that asserted that Humira was approved in December 2002 to treat RA and that the package insert was a, quote, prior art FDA approved label disclosing that regimen. And the package insert was also dated. It contained the date December 20th, 2002, and stated that the insert was quote unquote issued in, two th in December 2002. And I've put issued in, in quotations because that was actually an important factor here. And we'll see in, in a minute. But neither of the petitioner's experts addressed whether the package insert was publicly accessible in December 2002. Their opinions proceeded from the assumption that it constituted a printed publication. Next slide, please. Well, here, prior to institution, the board held that the petitioner failed to prove that the package insert was publicly accessible. And since this package insert formed a significant part of, of the grounds, the, the petition was ultimately denied prior to institution. So what, what went wrong? Well, first the board stated that that December 2002 date alone was insufficient to establish that the, that the package insert was in fact publicly accessible as of that date. I mean, you could put whatever date you want on it, but what if someone had sat on it and, and, and never put it forward? Then the board also noted that the petitioner didn't you know, fail to does not direct us to any source identifying information from the FDA, and they listed several examples. Well, it might be a copy of the insert on the FDA's website, uh, a publication date, or some other indicia indicating when that that package insert, in fact, became publicly available. The board also noted that the petitioner failed to explain how the regulatory approval of Humira in December 2002, because recall the petitioner had argued that the package insert was part of the, the FDA approved uh, label, uh, um, evidence that the package insert was in fact publicly accessible as of that date. And in fact, the FDA approval letter referred, uh, contained statements saying Humira will be marketing and the board said, well, that indicates that by December 31st, 2002, it had not been marketed to the public. So here there was no, even though the package insert was dated, there was no further evidence to show that it was publicly disseminated and thus publicly accessible uh, prior to the, the, to the critical date. Next slide, please. So what are our takeaways here? Public accessibility, if you're the petitioner, it, there, it is a potential pitfall. And you, have, you, you can't simply rely on a date that's on the package insert. You've got to do a lot more. You have to show that that package insert, the label, actually was publicly dis disseminated. So how do you do that? Well, it's going to require certainly additional evidence that evidence might include a uh, going back into the Wayback Machine, right, and and showing uh, that yes, it was posted on on the FDA's website as of as of this date, or yes, it will, and and this is how a person of ordinary skill looking through the FDA's website, the FDA's website is probably the easiest way to do it. But it's not necessarily the case that you'd go to FDA's website today and be able to pull right. off a label. Right. 
that you maybe dated 10 years ago, you have to actually use another resource, like you said, right. the Wayback Machine, to get a snapshot of what was on the FDA right. website back at that time. And, you know, for, for a patent owner, um, it, it provides at least a, a, a potential ground for attacking a petition prior to institution. And it, it becomes a, a in, in a preliminary response, it becomes a failure of proof issue for the for the petitioner, you didn't give us you didn't give us enough, and that can be a way, as you see in in um, the Zabby case of of uh, just killing uh, kill, killing the petition. Um, I didn't mention it here because you could say, well, okay, well, well, fine, but what what if in a situation like this you don't have any time bar mm -hmm. to filing? Can you simply refile? Well, it's funny because. One thing you could think of as well, that the 325D, excuse me, this is a serial challenge, so you're in a bind here now as the petitioner. But there was a decision that just came out on, on July 9th, and it was reported in IP360 today, and involved rituxin, which was actually the subject of the next case I want to discuss. But in any event, the um, initial petition was denied. Mm -hmm on the basis of failure to prove that a label is a printed publication. They came back, the grounds were slightly different, but the label was still in there. And the board granted the petition with a dissent from one of the, the judges hmm. on the ground that this should have been, you know, you used the other decision as a roadmap. Um, I mean, I say this because, look, as the petitioner, you want to get it right the first time. And so just bear in mind that you have a substantial burden to, to establish the public accessibility point. Um, but you may not be completely you, you may, foreclosed. You bet. No. So if we go to the next slide, I want further, for this, I think the Celtrion case illustrates how difficult it can be to prove a, a, a label as a printed publication. And what's interesting, actually, in this case, because this case went all the way to a final written decision, there were no preliminary responses filed. Um, so there was enough for, for the, the, the board to institute. So what do we have here? We had a patent covering a method of treating RA by administering rituximab and methotrexate. And the, the fact that it was treating RA is going to be important to the public accessibility point, and we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. And the petitioners have relied on the rituxan label as part of the obviousness challenge. And in the final written decision, the board held that petitioners failed to prove that the label was publicly accessible and thus qualified as a printed publication. And as a result, the board held that petitioners failed to prove that the challenge claims were unpatentable. So patent owner won. Next slide, please. So let's look at what some of the evidence that the petitioners offer, offered because they offered a lot. <laughs> well, first of all, they noted that the label bore a copyright date of 1997. They also argued that, uh, well, they submitted uh, as an exhibit um, an FDA approval letter for rituxan and argued that both it and the label were available on the FDA's website as part of the approval package for rituxan. And the petitioners submitted additional evidence purporting to show that FDA regulations required, Genentech was one of the patent owners here, to include the label with rituxan product when Genentech began selling the product in the United States. So on that basis, petitioners argued, we have established that the label is a printed publication. Next slide, please. Well, not so fast. <laughs> So first of all, the, the board stated the copyright date alone was not evidence that the label was publicly accessible. And that's, I mean, th that comes up over and over again. They, they printed it, but never was disseminated. Right, it's right. sat in shelves somewhere. Right. So the copy, you can't rely on the copyright date alone. But the board also found that the petitioners failed to prove, <clears throat> excuse me, that the label they retrieved in 2016 from the FDA's website, picking up, Tasha, on the, on the point you just raised, was in fact available on the website prior to the critical date in a manner that a person of ordinary skill could have located it through the exercise of reasonable diligence. 
So again, we're getting to the, well, first of all, is the label you got here the one that was actually the, the, the label before the critical date and was it publicly accessible? Next slide, please. And the, the board also dismissed the petitioner's argument that Exhibit 1037, which is the, 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 the label, was part of the FDA approval package. And here's what they said. They said, petitioners have not submitted documentary or testimonial evidence establishing that Exhibit 30, 1037 is, in fact, the drug label disseminated with rituximab at any time. At most, petitioner has shown that a drug label was disseminated with rituximab sales, but inviting us to speculate as to whether Exhibit 1037 is in fact a copy of the label that was disseminated. Now, the patent owner here had argued that petitioners failed to submit evidence showing that the FDA regulation on which the petitioners relied prohibited them from making any changes. And so here, the dispute is focusing on how do we know that that label was in fact the one that that was disseminated with the sale of rituxan. Now step back a minute because the patent donor knows what was what was disseminated. And yet they're sitting back and saying, well petitioners you you you, you failed to produce the evidence. That puts that that can put a patent donor in, in, a, in a real bind. Right. Next, uh, next slide, please. So here was an interesting twist. And by the way, here the New York, New Jersey CLE code is. Um, so what happened here? Knowing that this was the type of information that was in the patent owner's purview, the board authorized the petitioners to serve a request for admission on the patent owners, asking them to admit that that exhibit was in fact a true and correct copy of the label included with the sales of, of rituxan. Well, guess what? <laughs> Genentech denied, denied that it was a true and correct copy of the label and Biogen said it lacked sufficient information or, or, or knowledge to, to admit or deny. So that the petitioner in a bit of a bind here. <laughs> so let's go to the next slide, please. Time to try something else, perhaps. <laughs> which they did, which they did. And again, I think this is, this illustrates how, how tough it can be when you're relying on the label. So what happened here? So the petition said, okay, well, even if Genendic did not market Rituxan with that particular label, my Exhibit 1037, a copy of the label, was posted on Genentech's website as early as January 23rd, 1998. So now we have Panora's website, not the FDA's website, but Panora's website. And so look here what petitioners submitted now in trying to, um, to, 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 to prove that point. So first they, they exhibit a web page copy of the full prescribing information for rituxan that appeared on uh, Genentech's website. And they also included a declaration from the office manager from Internet Archives. We've got the Wayback Machine here. And the declaration included a web page copy of the label posted on the web page. So we solved the temporal issue. Mm -hmm. This is establishing what was on the web page as of January 23rd, 1998. And then the petitioners asserted, without supporting evidence, and this ended up being the Achilles heel, that Genentech's website was organized such that the label could be easily located. So this was a second attack or a, a second way of trying to get the label qualified as a printed publication. Next slide, please. Well, well, that didn't work either because now the PTAB considered whether the web page that included the prescribing information was a printed publication. And if they had concluded it was a printed publication, that would have, would have been fine for, for petitioners. But the board found the opposite, and it was because the, the petitioner failed to submit evidence supporting their allegation that the web, Genentex website would have permitted a person of ordinary skill to locate that exhibit. And I've concluded a quote here. 
Um, but now look what they're look, look what they're they're requiring. Um, first of all, they're talking about um, you know this this label talk is we're, we're talking about rheumatoid arthritis and that's the subject matter of the patent. But the label was, was talking about treating non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So here the board is saying, look, petitioners haven't offered evidence indicating that persons interested in treating rheumatoid or arthritis would have gone to the Genentech website for drug for, for information on a drug that was used to treat non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Petitioners could have done that, but they didn't. Um, they also said petitioners didn't submit any evidence showing that the website was maybe indexed and findable by an internet search engine. So there's nothing on that point. And here, that, that last line, petitioners submit only attorney argument that the website was organized such that the label could be easily located. So what the board is saying here is, look, if you want to rely on that web page, there were two missing pieces of information here. One was that a person of ordinary skill would have, would have trying to treat rheumatoid arthritis would have looked to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and second, that the website was, was organized. An expert could have done that, but they didn't. Uh, next slide, please. So what are, the, what are some of our, 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 our takeaways here? Well, first of all, if, if it's not already apparent, it's, it's tough to prove that a label is a printed publication. I think in that Celtrion case, you saw multiple attempts, multiple strategies, and, and, all and they all- All the same point. And right, and they, all, and, they, and, and they all failed. Um, certainly, if you're relying on a non-governmental website, you're gonna need an expert declaration showing that person of ordinary skill would have looked to that site in the first place, so maybe here, showing a link between RA and, and, and lymphoma. Um, and then also that the website was navigable and indexed and it would be easy enough to find. So there was an additional, uh, actually a couple of additional pieces of information here that, that were missing. So quite a high hurdle. So we know that the copyright date alone is not gonna be enough. Right. If we look on the FDA website today regarding information about a label that was present maybe 10 years ago, that's not enough. You have to take another step. Maybe you're going to get a declaration from somebody who's uh, at the Internet Archives to say that this is the version of the label that was present at that time. But even then, you might uh, hit some hurdles going through um, the process of proving this to be a printed publication. And then if you're going into this uh, their own website, patent owner's own website, make sure you have these extra um, uh, points uh, in your declaration. You have to support that even more there. Right. Yeah. So again, high hurdles. The, I think the takeaway for a patent owner is that these are all things you should be thinking about attacking. I mean, here is, it was interesting because there were no preliminary responses. All of this came out in, in the owner's responses. But it was still ultimately successful in the end. Seems like a checklist for both petitioners and patent owners. Do I have yep. all of this? Or if they don't right. have all of this, this right. is uh, something right. that we should look into. So we can have the next slide, please. All right, great. So I think we're going to transition to our last section where we're just going to talk about um, some proposed legislation just to keep your eye on for the remainder of 2018. Uh, and specifically, we wanted to talk about the Hatch-Waxman Integrity Act. This was recently proposed by Senator Hatch of Utah um, earlier in June. Hatch of Hatch Waxman, that's right. <laughs> Who I believe will be retiring soon. Yeah, so it won't be. <laughs> um, so he seeks to restore, the purpose of this act is to, to restore the careful balance that the Hatch Waxman Act struck to incentivize generic drug development. And it proposes amendments to the Food Drug and Cosmetic Act and the Biologics Price Competition and Innovation Act, as well as federal security regulations. So it's not it's not just Orange Book. No, like, no, nope, yeah. this, is, this is expanding now to biologics too. Right, exactly. Um, so and and arguably even broader with the federal security True. regulations. Um, so basically, what this act is proposing is that the generic applicants certify that neither the applicant nor any party in privity with the applicant has filed or will file a petition 
to institute IPR review or post parent review of the patent. And in making the certification, the applicant is not relying in whole or in part on any decision issued by the PTAB regarding IPR or post grant review. So basically, they're they're telling you to choose. They're saying that you know if you want to participate um, in in IPRs, you might be excluded from having other resources available to you under the Hatch Waxman Act. How does that strike you, Dorothy? It's it, it's it's pretty draconian right I mean well, especially here because I'm thinking it's it's not just um, it, you know orange book patents that would be subject to you know the whole hatch waxman process but also biologics and I mean what it is is an attempt to uh, to carve them out to, to carve them out I mean this is it is this has come up before I mean looking for even a, a legislative fix that would have specifically excluded biopharma that right. didn't go over too, too well. But this would be, I suppose it's, it's, it's a modified form of that saying, okay, we're not going to carve it out, but we're going to force you to choose. Right. Um, and I mean, looking back, it, looking back to, you know, our statistics, you kind of wonder whether it's, it's overkill and fixing a problem that actually may be resolving itself. In terms of the institution rates, that you're right, the institution in rates. Are, but I mean, again, I, I can understand uh, a patent owner, again, I, particularly in the Hatch-Waxman context, that says, "Wait a minute, you know, there was an entire process developed for a generic to challenge these orange book patents, these orange book patents, mm -hmm. was, and it's we shouldn't be now forced to fight on, on on two different fronts." So I have some some sympathy there. This is very broad, though. Yeah, and so if we go to the next slide, uh, as we mentioned, it's not just targeting orange book patents, but also uh, biosimilar applications. So the same type of certification, if you're looking to bring a biosimilar to market under the BPCIA, uh, you are you have to make this certification that you uh, have not filed or will not file an IPR petition or post-grant review of the patent. Uh, and as we alluded to earlier, there, it's a little bit broader even still. We're looking for... Um, amendments to the Security Exchange Act, where basically it's trying to get at um, issues we saw before with Kyle Bass, where he and his Coalition for Affordable um, Drugs were, were targeting life science patents um, in supposedly short sale of the short sale of stock associated with it. So targeting the petition, doing some stock market sales, and then profiting as a result. And so this added uh, aspect of the act would look for a certification that's basically saying that you're not going to engage in any short sales when you're filing. But of course, those those cases, he, he, Kyle Bass is out of the game yeah, now. Yeah, he's done. I think, you know, at the end of the day, he had one year where he was busy and he, he said how many IPRs he was going to uh, file. He did it and then it that, then it was done. Uh, everybody's moved but on. Largely, you don't see the this, this situation, the, the hedge fund. Right, it's the, not the hot topic that it was right, two right. years ago. And so that's why I wonder whether some of the proposals here are addressing a, a problem that no longer no longer really exists. Right, and we, I mean, this has also come up before. This isn't the first legislation that had a proposals to have these types of certifications or amendments that say you're not gonna short sell stock. Um, so this has come, come before. Uh, this is the latest uh, round of it that, um, that Senator Hatch is promoting this year. Um, and so we, We'll continue to watch that. We haven't seen any um, real debate about this yet, um, but it's something to keep an eye on um, since it is on his top list this year. Can to go to the next slide? Oh, that's our resources. Actually, I want to also add here that um, there there was a uh, there's a bill I think proposed in the House that would actually abolish IPRs altogether. So that's that, that's even even more extreme, and I think there is a, there is a concern uh, that somehow these uh, that that IPRs diminish the value of of patents, and you know you hear about the patent death squad and 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 everything. Um, I mean, like, as Tasha noted, these are developments we monitor. If you have strong views either way, you should find ways to get involved in in lobbying. But um, again, the, the the stats themselves are are, are I find very interesting. Mm -hmm. And 
they might suggest that the playing field is more level than you think. And we might not need legislation to, to fix any supposed problem with IPRs. So we are actually coming up at the top of the hour. I want to take a moment to thank everyone for attending today's presentation. If you need to drop off, please feel free to, to do so. A replay of the webinar, including the full Q&A session, will be posted on Fish and Richardson's website within 48 hours. We'll also be posting a copy of the slides. Uh, for for uh, those of you in New York and New Jersey, please download and complete the CLE form available in the handout section of the widget and send to Lauren McGovern at McGovern at fr.com. And we are actually going to see, do we have any questions here? Um, why can't I see the question? <laughs> here? Oh, no, sorry. I'm... Okay, Ari, Ari, well, first question, Ari, Orange Book listed patents. I think, I think likely drug companies invest a lot more time drafting since usually potentially more valuable. That was someone, someone's uh, an IMHO. I think there's a, there's, a, there's a point to that too. I mean, the, um, what, what's often said is that when you look at some of the patents over in the, in the tech area, they're, they're really for a different purpose. Right. So I think that's, that, that's a valid point. See, why do you think labels are why do you think labels are admitted under such strict standards compared to to other printed publications? Um, I, I think the other, the other printed publications are typically easier if you have a patent or a, a journal article. Yeah, textbooks. I mean, yeah. The other area though where it does come up is is abstracts. Right. Uh, just because it was presented at a conference that occurred on such and such a day that doesn't necessarily mean that the abstract itself was published. So abstracts also are going to be subject to some of the similar to some of the similar issues on printed publications. And the same lines um, poster presentations would you Right, say too? right. And when were they po when were they available on, on a website? Was a website searchable? Mm -hmm. Um, et cetera. So it will be labels and uh, abstracts, anything really other than a, a journal article, textbook, or, or patent. And the COE code was and with that, I think we are all set. I'd like to thank everyone for their time. I'd like to thank Tasha. And uh, we'll post an on-demand replay within 48 hours on our website. And we look forward to seeing you again at our next uh, at our next webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.